room on the chat to ask questions, but it's also possible to unmute and we will um, uh, we will be entertaining questions, certainly uh, during the presentation, but afterwards as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. The title of our, we have two, um, two topics to cover. One is patient selection, uh, which I'll be uh, leading off with. And the second is complications, which will be uh, Barry's responsibility. And we're gonna try to keep it uh, uh, relatively on time, but I know we have a very verbose uh, group of speakers here. So um, we'll just have to be cognizant of that. Uh, so the title of, of this portion of the webinar is patient selection. And that's why I have a, a picture of one of my patients. I think it all starts and stops there. Uh, the successful application of TORS really hinges on, I think, patient selection. And that's why it's the lead off uh, for our series. Um, again, I wanna introduce our, our faculty for the evening. Dr. Wenig is professor and, professor and chair at the uh, University of Illinois Chicago and is co-moderating with me tonight. Uh, Dr. David Cognetti is joining us from Philadelphia. He's professor and chair. Congratulations, uh, David, um, uh, at Thomas Jefferson University. Mahir Patel uh, joins us from Emory University, associate professor, and Dr. Turner uh, joins us as an assistant professor from Thomas, I'm sorry, not from Thomas, just from, from West Virginia. Um, apologies for that. I also want to thank the uh, American Head Neck Society faculty leadership. This was put together by a very and very involved group. And these are uh, many of the, the leaders who will be involved in the upcoming webinar series. Drs. DeVury, Holsinger, Richmond, uh, May St. John and um, Dr. Winnig. We also have administrative support uh, from the Headneck Society, Nicole Von Husen, Colleen Elkins, and Christine Sass. And it's just important to recognize our industry support from Intuitive Surgical, who has uh, provided a, uh, a you know, hands-off approach, uh, strings-free uh, grant uh, to support this effort as well as fellowship training efforts. So let's get started. Um, so first some ground rules for the discussion today. And I, know, I, I see uh, Mihir's uh, getting a big grin on this. You know, patient selection, there's patient factors, there's tumor factors, but for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna be focusing on tumor factors. So let's just assume, we'll assume for the, e for the evening that we have an ideal patient. Um, now, if you want to get into some diabetic, obese patients with trismus and kyphosis, you know, we can talk about that a little bit too. But for the most part, we'll just assume that patients are uh, relatively healthy and have normal exposure. And then, um, of course, when it comes to patient selection, uh, there's assessing the resectability of the primary tumor. And then there's also considerations around the nodes. And so we'll kind of try to cover both of those. And feel free um, uh, to chime in, I guess, as we go along. I'll be asking uh, individual questions, but uh, panelists, feel free to, to interject as you wish. So wanted to start with this case. This is um, a relatively, uh, a hopefully straightforward case. This is a 45-year-old patient presented uh, with a feeling of uh, a lump in the throat. On visual inspection, you can see there's a, a mass confined within the tonsor fossa, stages a T2, N0, P16 positive tumor on biopsy. So I'm going to open this up to a poll for the, um, uh, for the audience, and I like to get folks input. So who would offer this patient surgery? Would you recommend primary tours for this patient? We'll give a minute for the votes to register. And um, uh, panelists, you can, you, can, uh, you can weigh in as well. What was the nodal status again? 
So this okay. is N0. Okay. So the tumor just confined to the tonsor fossa. This is the, you know, it's kind of a rare bird a little bit, but um, confined. And it's clinically N0 or radiographically? Clinically and radiographically N0. So looks like- And, and Nail, is it fixed to the pterygoid? Medial pterygoid by exam? Um, not sure who's talking there, but uh, uh, this is Embraverall, uh, Arkansas. Oh, okay, great. <clears throat> uh, no, no clinical or radiographic evidence of any fixation. So I know I'm not giving a lot. There's an image there and saying, "What would you do?" Um, but uh, sometimes that's how it goes in these sorts of panels. Now let me spice it up a little bit. And ask the pan, um, ask on this one. So this is a different patient, also the same stage, T2, N0, P16 positive uh, with the tumor, but this one is less exophytic. It has a more endophytic appearance, as you can see on the imaging here. Uh, there's no trismus, um, but it has a more endophytic appearance. And so I'd like to get the, um, the audience's opinion on this one as well. So as, um, as people are kind of casting their votes, maybe I'll start off with, um, with you, Mahir, because you seem eager to go. Um, tell me how you, how you think about this concept of endophytic versus exophytic. So we had the first one was a a really exophytic tumor. This one has, at least radiographically, looks more endophytic. Majority of people are saying they would not offer surgery. What What are your thoughts? So, I, I, as <clears throat> you know, uh, I progress with experience. I have shied away from the more endophytic uh, tumors. However, I do think sometimes the CT scans or, or imaging can belie the the um, pathologic stage or classification. And so personally, if I see a scan like this uh, versus what the first option was, uh, in this case, like for the first patient, I may not take them for a DL uh, to get a better assessment of tumor resectability. Uh, in this case, I, I may, or if I can get a decent um, exam in, in the clinic, whether you know, it's mobile or not, if they're depending on a gag reflex for everyone. But I, I will say, particularly in the tongue base, I've shied away from the very endophytic tumors. But if I felt like they didn't have trismus and I could get a good plane and a clean, deep margin, um, I would I would still go after it. However, that tongue base there, it looks like in the sulcus or, you know, there it looks fairly concerning. So I think part of, for me, the ultimate decision wouldn't rest on the CT scan. Gotcha, combination of clinical and radiographic picture. David, which do you trust more, your clinical exam or the, imag or the imaging? Uh, <laughs> thanks, Neil. Uh, so I think clinical exam is most important. It, it overrides imaging 100% of the time. And it's interesting, I, I reflect sometimes as we all dealt with the pandemic and did some telemedicine and reviewed some films before people came in and you were forced to try to anticipate what your exam might be based on the imaging you're seeing up front. Uh, it, it, it surprised me that it's not always easy to predict which ones will end up being mobile or not, just look at the imaging. Uh, so uh, clinical exam for sure. And, and, and tonsil like this, it's a good example. You can't really know, is this crossing the GT sulcus involving the tongue base or is just a tongue laying against it? Is this tumor fixed or not? And those are critical decisions to your uh, choice for surgery. Great. All right. I will, I, I will add one, just one uh, comment to, to that real quick, um, Neil, is that, you know, I've taken a case where the scan actually looked like it was very resectable and then I, in this particular case, it started at the retromolar trigone, and I saw a tumor essentially through the constrictor. I, I mean, it was difficult, but I aborted the case. I, it was very, you know, and I just felt like ultimately I couldn't clear the margin. So, uh, it, like, you know, supporting it, what, what David's saying. And I would just add, I'm not 
the concept of endophytic versus exophytic, I think, is very applicable to tongue-based tumors. I'm not sure how applicable it is to a tonsil tumor, which they they all sort of sit in the tonsil fossa. Uh, to me, the the different the differentiator there is is the tumor fixed. How mobile is it? Can I feel the edge and the and and space between it and the retromolar trigone? I was going to say, it's to me, part of my clinical exam that's super important is the actually endoscopic, the flexible endoscopic exam. And that's even more useful to me than the like direct laryngoscopic exam. I'll make my decision on whether or not I'm going to operate based on that because it's dynamic. You can see uh, the, the patient when they stick out their tongue you get a sense of how endophytic or exophytic that basic tone um, mass is. And also in the GT sulcus, you get a really good sense of like, does it fall away from the wall? Can you see all the edges? Um, is the lingual surface of the epiglottis, uh, you know, involved? And, and I get a lot more there without, you know, bleeding, without swelling from an attempted intubation by anesthesia. Um, that's like the most pristine uh, exam. And it often is completely um, different than what you see radiographically, because depending on the position of the, the patient in the CT scan, you know, like how they're laying down, how the tongue base has, has collapsed and sort of flexed back while they're on the scanner, um, you, you may miss like where the edges are and what is attached and what isn't. And is there a free edge there? You can sort of sneak around with your flexible scope and see all the areas laterally, posteriorly, medially. So I get a ton of information, um, not, not to mention what is the, the soft palate surface look like, you know, um, in the nasopharynx. So uh, I think you get a sense too that if there's going to be a lot of VPI, um, does that soft palate move above it or not? Does it look involved? So, yeah, I think that uh, nasopharyngoscopy is really important. Good clinical exam is is hard to substitute. Here's another case. Speaking of a uh, uh, fiber optic exam, this is a patient um, with a base of tongue mass. You can see on the right hand side, it fills the vollecula. It comes to the midline kind of pause it here. You can see it comes to the midline, not across the midline. Um, and I wanted to get thoughts from the panelists about where they draw the line in terms of medial extent of a base of tongue tumor. And maybe, um, maybe David, you can lead us off on this one. Neil, I, I appreciate how these cases have one piece of information and not complete because, <laughs> of, of course, for in, in, in real life, we'd be looking at the scans as well. But to answer your question, so th this one is nice because you can see the, the preserved anatomy of the lingual tonsils. The midline cleft is sort of sitting up on it. Uh, I agree with Megan's comments about flexible laryngoscopy for a tumor like this. You can have them stick out the tongue. You could get a uh, hopefully get a good view of, is it involving the lingual surface of the epiglottis, et cetera. Uh, so this to me is likely, unless there's some sort of deep extent or uh, an exposure issue, likely going to be a candidate for robotic surgery and it, at a minimum would get a look in the operating room. In terms of extent across midline, I, I'm willing to take on tumors that approach midline. I'm willing to take on tumors that superficially cross midline. It's really the depth of the defect that's anticipated contralaterally that will impact uh, my willingness uh, to recommend surgery. And that's, that's both from a functional standpoint as well as risk to the contralateral uh, arterial system. Mahir, uh, any, any uh differences in opinion on that, or do you abide by the same approach? I do. I, I'm very similar. I mean, probably word for word to what Dave's saying, where I, you know, uh, I would go to try and get uh, ideally a, you know, two, three millimeter margin mucosally on that. And then hopefully it, it then tracks, you can track me, uh, I guess, laterally towards the tumor after you get the uh, superficial aspect of that 
uh, of that contralateral lingual tonsil if you need any of it. Um, yeah, it, but that I would, I would, I would do that. Yeah, so yes. Well, D David had asked about some imaging. This is some imaging of a slightly different patient. And I think uh, given the comments so far, maybe I'll open it up to a poll from the audience first then, and then Megan, you can, you can weigh in as well about uh, just looking at these images alone for the primary tumor, would you, would you recommend, um, would you recommend TORS? So the polling is open. Again, there's uh, nobody's being graded on this. This is a on the fly assessment with limited information. Appreciate that that's not an, always an easy uh, situation. Megan, any thoughts looking at these images? Um, so I, this is like not a very clear cut answer. Um, this I think has to be determined. I would still offer tours, um, but I think that the patient needs a lot of counseling on this one because I think you can get negative margins. Um, it doesn't invade the intrinsic musculature. It doesn't look like on that scan. As long as there's no problems with tongue deviation and there's full mobility, you know, it, but the problem is it's right in the midline. So you're not, you know, you're not sparing this patient, um, you know, bilateral versus unilateral. You know, the ideal patient is a unilateral operation, unilateral, well lateralized lesion, left side, you know, unilateral neck dissection, all that. Um, a very young patient, though, who is likely to survive this and live for a long time with high doses um, could potentially have a lower dose of radiation to everything if you can get negative margins. And just looking at that scan, you know, this looks like a fairly large tumor. Um, so it's really not ideal. Uh, if this were a little bit smaller, you know, you really can't tell just based on the scan what's lingual tonsil tissue and what's tumor, you know, like where the tumor edges are. Um, so because it's superficial, I think that's a question mark. To me, I see possibly a lot of lingual tonsil tissue in there. Uh, but if that, look, if that were superficial on the direct laryngoscopy, um, I think you could overall lower the total dose of radiation. Uh, and if there's no neck nodes or anything, then maybe they don't need chemotherapy. So you may have like better long-term toxicity. I don't think that that is known yet. You know, like this is that question mark patient. Um, it's certainly not the ideal patient. And I think you really have to talk to them about where their goals. Yeah. Cause they are going to have trouble swallowing the bilateral, uh, tongue, base of tongue cancer, there's significant post-surgical dysphagia. Um, and I've had a patient just like this and, and he really didn't reach his immediate post-op swallowing until almost one year. So my enthusiasm for doing that is pretty low, but if the patient is, you know, hell-bent on surgery, young I think there's, there's, that's one of those question marks that we need to be looking at. Does that benefit them? All right. Well, we talked about, you're talking, this kind of leads us to the neck, um, which is the next part of, of the patient selection. And, you know, this is a case where bilateral neck dissection um, uh, would be needed, needed. Neil, can, can we make a, can I just make a comment on that scan before you get to the neck? Yeah. If you put it back up, I, I think that scan, not that one. <laughs> that one, yeah. I, I think this scan highlights your point earlier of endophytic versus exophytic. And, and I don't know, I'm trying to annotate here, but you know, the, the, the majority of this tumor is very exophytic. This is fluffy lingual tonsils sitting on the tongue base. And you can almost uh, anticipate that this surgery wouldn't be much different than a tongue-based reduction for sleep apnea or a, a mucosectomy in terms of the ultimate muscular defect. And the, the other thing I would point out is, and this is why before when you asked me imaging versus exam, uh, 
I think exam is very important here because when you have an exophytic tumor like this, the tumor might just be pushing across midline with a preserved midline cleft there. And that this isn't even involving bilateral base of tongue. And, and so without examination, I'd be hard pressed to say that this patient is not a candidate. I, mean, I think those are well, fair Yeah, I, I, I probably would, um, you know, uh, steer them away from tours. I mean, just based on the scan alone. I mean, that's just my personal practice at this point. Uh, some of the T2 tongues I, that could, you know, and again, just looking at the scan, um, uh, we experienced some, some trouble in the swallow, you know, from swallowing long-term. Um, it, it's, it's tough. It's a tough call. I'm not saying they have feeding tubes, but there, there's definitely some trouble. So if you just asked me, like, would I just do it based on the scan? I would probably shy away from this one. Yeah, and you know, the panel is very, the panel is split and the audience was split as well. And obviously it's limited information that we're working on here. Um, but it's, it's, it does give me um, pause to think about going to the contralateral side and doing bilateral neck dissections. It's a lot to add to patients when you um, have a high chance of needing radiation. Um, so wanted to move on to this case. Uh, and again, in this, in this scenario, we are essentially ignoring the primary. We're assuming that the primary is kind of a chip shot, a small T1 tumor, uh, but uh, it's got this neck node, which is necrotic, and the margins of it are against the sternocleidomastoid muscle are hazy, suggestive of at least microscopic extranodal extension. Um, and I wanted to probe the, the panelist about resectability here, but let's start by, by polling the audience uh, based on just looking at the uh, imaging here, this one slice of the neck, assuming the primary is very amenable to TORS, would you offer a primary surgical approach uh, looking at this node? So while that's kind of um, coming up, I'll ask uh, uh, Megan, if you can, you can start us off, I suppose. Your thoughts around um, you know, whether or not a patient is amenable to TORS based on the status of their neck? Um, well, so I would say that this is an area where literature really needs to guide you. And um, the literature shows there's not really a great correlation between a radiologist's observation and the true pathologic outcomes. You can't really tell. Um, and that will vary institution to institution. So for instance, like, uh, I, my uh, colleagues tend to overcall it. Um, and uh, this is an area where it really needs to be studied. And we also need to study what is the significance of microscopic versus macroscopic uh, invasion or extranodal extension. And so if the clinical exam you know, doesn't show obvious fixation. There's no fixation to the muscles. There's no, it moves uh, and they don't have pain when they turn their, their head or their neck. Um, I'm less likely to believe that that's, that's true extranodal extension. Um, and this size, um, the larger you go, um, there's, there's good data out there. In fact, I think that's one of uh, Dave's studies from the National Cancer Database. Um, you know, that suggests that the larger you go over, you know, four centimeters or so, you may have that extranodal extension, but we, we don't really know where that starts. Um, I, I've certainly had four centimeter neck masses that have had no extranodal extension. Um, so I, th this patient still may benefit. Um, so this is somebody you would probably offer surgery to, assuming the primary is accessible. Yes, if it's only one node that looks like that and yeah. it's not fixed in their neck on exam. You can see that the audience was mixed here. Um, David, you were just referenced one of your uh, many publications. So uh, what are your comments about, about the possibility of extranodal extension, either gross or micro 
microscopic in assessing uh, tours. Yeah, and so <laughs> congratulations, Neil. You're 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 hitting these well because you're getting 50-50 splits on the polls, right? So so you're you're reaching your goal of controversy. Um, uh, this scan, the the quality of the image is a little difficult for us. And even if it were better, I agree with Megan's comments that it's it's a little bit hard to predict ECE sometimes. I will reiterate again that I do think examination even of the neck is really important because if this is a really mobile lymph node thin guy, you just, you feel like you have a good exam on it, it would not, this exam would not shy me away from tours. Um, you know, some of our data uh, does show like in a surgically treated neck, you don't get regional recurrence in HPV positive disease. In a non-surgically treated neck, there is a, a decent chance that this node cystic and, and thick like this will have a post-surgical neck dissection. And, and it's not surprising that you end up with a 50-50 split here because it's a little bit hard to predict. One of my criteria for am I willing to do surgery is what's the chance of me hurting somebody with surgery? And I think even if this came back with more ECE than I expected and we end up escalating a little bit, uh, there's a pretty low risk that the surgery is gonna hurt them based on your description of the primary site. And uh, the fact that this is unlikely to involve 11 at this, at this location. So in, in my practice, this would still at least qualify for a discussion that includes surgery. Um, Mihir, any, any uh, final comments? You know, some would argue this patient, if you operate, they're likely to receive triple modality therapy. Um, what, what, what is your take on cases yeah. like this and, yeah. and those sort of um, comments? I, I mean, I think it's a, uh, you know, this case just highlights the, the controversy in, in this whole arena. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it, it's great that you bring this up. Uh, I think the ultimate question or the root of the question is, do we have to add chemotherapy to the patient's treatment? So obviously institution to institution trials and such may vary. So that will probably impact decision-making. But if you're considering the standard of care and that, maybe most people use uh, adding chemotherapy and your concern, I'm just going to bring it a little bit on the, you know, the other side of things. I, I mean, I, again, I would probably, I mean, I, I would offer this patient operation, but I'm going to bring it to the other side. I'm going to bring the other side of things into this. When you look at study from, from Hopkins, recent study looking at, they looked at a couple of factors, including stranding and necrosis with a high, um, uh, sensitivity, although specificity wasn't super high, but it, it, it leaned, it, it guided their uh, decision-making in terms of whether or not they would offer the patient surgery. So I think these are, you know, when you think of external extension in general, all comers, you're looking at anywhere from 20 to 40%. And so that's a decent number that may have to have chemotherapy. So you may guess, you know, you could flip the coin on this even and say that, well, um, maybe they have more of a chance of needing it. And so in those cases, I think, you know, I, I agree. I don't want to hurt them and I don't want to over treat as well. And I think until we get that under, better understood, I'd, I'd like to avoid chemotherapy. I think it will be difficult to figure that out in the phase three, uh, study, but I think ECOG 3311 has been very helpful in identifying which patients may be able to avoid with minimal external extension chemotherapy. So that complicates it even further, but I think you have a strong argument for not offering uh, tours just based on this neck scan. I, I'd just like to add though, that in our, in my institution, our practice would be if this has micro ECE, they would not get chemotherapy. And I, I think that's important to know up front because it would impact your decision-making. Absolutely. What, we would do the same. Of, but what extent yes. of E&E &E would, would buy chemotherapy, uh, Jefferson? <laughs> Macro or gross? And then your next question is, how do you define that? <laughs> yeah, it's a discussion and it's a pathologic review. 
and it, it involves the surgeon input in terms of the gross findings at surgery, and it involves the histologic input from the pathologist. And, and these are openly discussed. But, but it, it, you know, what, what happens if you get this out and there's no ECE? You yeah. know, you wouldn't find, you wouldn't know that if you didn't do the surgery. And I'll, I'll just say, I, I have worked in a state with a very um, complex uh, referral pattern and there are widely variable practices, even with in different regions of the state. So I have a set of radiation oncologists who for, wouldn't even consider if it said extra nodal extension, they're going to, no matter micro, ma macro, they, they're not going to listen to that. And they see it, they're going to fully dose on 70 gray. So it wouldn't matter a hill of beans. The ones that at the home base, you know, at the main center, those radiation oncologists are willing to have a discussion. So I sometimes have to make my decision based on who I'm going to be working with. Yeah, that's a good point. I definitely have run into that as well. Well, I want to make sure we have um, time for the complications portion. Dr. Winnig is going to be leading that. There is some uh, questions that are in the chat room. So I welcome the panelists uh, to uh, give feedback on those, I guess. And Barry, why don't you move forward with the complications part of it, just so we don't slow down the, uh, the overall progress here. Sure. Thank you, everybody. Uh -huh. Um, great. Well, thank you, Neil. I appreciate it. I promised the panelists that I would um, lob them softballs, um, and the complications are all mine. So uh, I'm not asking them for their complications, just asking them for their ideas about things. Um, so um, the first case I'd like to present is a 62-year-old male with a history of a P16 negative base of tongue squamous cell. Um, the patient had an uneventful tours, base of tongue resection, um, with um, a right um, modified radical neck dissection where the jugular was sacrificed. Um, there was no ligation of the lingual artery, no trach, and um, the patient had a feeding tube placed. Um, what I want to do is um, pull up the. Okay, um, so this this is a CT just to kind of show you what, um, um, what was going on with this patient prior to, to surgery. This was his original uh, appearance. So you can see that he had um, bulky disease on both sides, aside from having a large base of tongue tumor. Um, let me go back to, that's just a sad view. Um, so that was uneventful. And we decided to stage the neck um, and um, did the contralateral side five days later. Um, and he, on this side, the jugular was sacrificed as well as was part of the SCM. Again, the lingual artery was not ligated. Um, patient did well. He was discharged two days later um, and came back um, subsequently two days after discharge. So um, from the beginning, post-op day number nine um, with oral bleeding. Um, so um, I'd like to throw this out to the panelists. Um, no particular order, but um, the question that I would ask, well, let's start with David. Um, the question I would ask is, um, how would you handle the bleed? Um, would you ligate the carotid? And what's your position on carotid ligation? So you want me to start forward and, and work backwards. So, so uh, obviously, any, any post-tours bleed needs to be handled very seriously. And so I'm assuming this patient has made it back to the hospital and is somewhere, uh, you know, under your direct observation at this point. Uh, this patient would certainly buy a trip back to the operating room. And, uh, you, you know, you would like to assess the sources of bleeding, uh, all the caveats for managing the airway appropriate. Lee, and once, once the airway is secure, you want to, to the best you can, identify where the source of the bleeding is. I guess I have to answer your last question next because I would ligate the lingual artery electively in every TORS case. And in this patient, based on the scan that you showed, I would do it on the right side. Obviously, I would not advocate for bilateral lingual artery ligation. You can't do that. 
but but based on the the imaging prior, I doubt that the left sided lingual artery is at risk. So in this situation, if that had not been done, and that's the bleeding source, then yes, there there should be some management, whether ligation or embolization or et cetera, depending on what the status of the neck is at that time. <clears throat> okay, well, I would like, we have a polling question um, regarding this before we move on to our other two panelists, but unfortunately, for some reason, I'm not seeing it to be able to pull it up. I don't know, Nicole, is it possible for you? There to we go. Oh, there we go, good, okay. Um, so um, this is a poll question. My preference for prophylactic lingual artery ligation for torus basic tongue. Um, just want to see what the uh, what the audience believes, including the panelists if they're voting. Um, so it seems like there is an overwhelming. Um, well, now it's coming down a little bit. Um, preference. Um, so I guess it's pretty no. split. Um, Can you release the results? Um, yeah. There we go. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I'm just having trouble uh, getting the polling stuff um, brought up, so I apologize for that. Um, but we can see that um, the majority of people are gonna are gonna ligate it um, all the time. So getting back to this case, uh, Megan, um, how how would you deal with it? How would you handle the bleed? And what's your position on on lingual artery ligation? Um, I always ligate. I have to be able to sleep at night. Um, <laughs> uh, it's just, I think it one, well, this is something I've studied as well, but you know, your major bleeding rate, uh, seems to be significantly impacted by what, and by major, I mean, a, a bleed that requires operative intervention. Um, so if you did it, a full torch resection, it wasn't just a lingual tonsillectomy for, uh, you know, identification of the unknown primary, then um, I always ligate. And I don't just ligate the lingual, I also ligate the facial because there's a lingual branch, uh, the dorsal lingual that comes off of the facial right at the back of the submandibular gland um, that can cause bleeding. So I ligate them both. Um, and uh, if I have bleeding, I'm still gonna go back and check it out. You can have superficial mucosal bleeding. I think it, it matters what post-operative day you are. The closer you are to your original operation, your, your major bleeds happen day four, day five. And then your, your minor bleeds of sort of akin to a tonsillectomy bleed that's just granulation tissue tend to happen later. Um, but I, I think there's benefit in going back and and looking for yourself. And you can apply clips. Um, if you're really concerned, you can ligate, uh, you know, transcervically, but that is a much harder thing to do um, uh, in a pinch and, and airway first, obviously. But um, yeah, that's how I feel. Did, we, did I cover everything you asked? You did, you did. And Mahir, yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, I, I would do exactly what uh, you know, pretty much verbatim how David would, would do this. It's almost, uh, and I, I always do ligate the lingual as well as the facial, 100% of the time. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Um, what if you're doing a, a torus tonsil, a radical tonsillectomy without any significant base of tongue resection? Um, what do you, how are you gonna handle um, the, the lingual and or the facial? Um, as well, would you automatically tie it off? Would you not tie it off? Um, because you're you're risking less uh, of the likelihood of a of a lingual bleed. Um, let's let's start out with me here. Uh, you know, it's uh, it doesn't change. I, for every tours case that I do, um, I will do the I ligate the. The facial and lingual, whether it's a tonsil or base of tongue. Um, I have had one scenario where the <clears throat> I, I went fairly low on a base of tongue and um, I had an arterial bleed that ultimately was embolized, but it was this superior, um, it was off of the superior thyroid. It was that branch uh, 
one of the smaller branches that ended up being. So if I go really low on a base of tongue, I will also include that, but that is rare. Megan, you agree with that? Um, I do, and uh, I would say it's because um, uh, I have sidewalled uh, the vessel, uh, even even as in doing a radical tonsillectomy. And one of the reasons is, is there's to me there's no difference between a radical tonsillectomy and a lateral or a pharyngectomy. I always take a little bit of the base of tongue, trying to make sure I get a, a negative margin, and um, it's just the same operation for me every time. And that side uh, vessel or side injury to the vessel um, led me to have a, a lingual artery pseudoaneurysm that bled on post-operative day like five. Um, and it was a, a major hemorrhage and it was scary. Um, you know, the patient lived because I was worried about it. Um, and I kept him in the hospital longer than um, my typical patient, not to mention he, was at, he just happened to be having pretty bad swallowing uh, trouble. And it, it, it was something that I identified on CT scan and then it had to go and deal with later. Um, so it's just a better part of, of valor to me to, to ligate while I'm in the neck. It's easy. I can sleep at night. I don't worry about having missed a bleed um, and, or even missed an injury, a sidewall injury, because I didn't even have, um, pronounced bleeding in that, in that case. You know, I think it was a thermal injury to the sidewall of the vessel. Um, so, and, and that's, I've seen that twice, once in fellowship and once, uh, with me personally. Um, you know, the only other time that I wouldn't, uh, is if it was a salvage case. Um, and you're not doing the neck dissection. It's only like a, a local recurrence and there's no recurrence in the neck or you're not planning on doing the neck dissection. Uh, and in that case, I'm, I might do a trick um, because I expect them to have swallowing trouble and because of, of the bleeding risk and wanting to secure the airway and then maybe not being able to protect their airway because of lack of sensation. Uh, it with a slow bleed and they might actually have trouble worse than the regular patient, so. And David? So uh, I, I agree with what's been said thus far, which is I, I ligate the lingual and facial in every patient. The only exception would be base of tongue, mucosectomy, superficial resections for unknown primary. primary. But for every known tumor resection, it's both. And part of it is I don't like the subjectiveness of, did I take a lot of base of tongue? Did I take a little base of tongue? I, I like a hard and fast protocol that's not forgotten and done in every case because the, the downside of tying off these vessels is very low in my opinion. And the, uh, uh, when, you have, when you don't tie it off and you have a catastrophic bleed, that downside is very, very high. Um, I can comment, you know, and I'd compliment Neil for his paper on this, highlighting the importance of the ligation and the role of it in, in, in decreasing the catastrophic bleeding that we're describing. Uh, we'll put in a comment on first bite syndrome, which is something we reported on. I'd, I'd love to talk to uh, uh, or hear uh, Neil, because one difference between he and I is I don't go after the ascending pharyngeal. I haven't, uh, you know, I haven't found it necessary when we looked at our first bite syndrome, it seems to be correlated a bit with going after the ascending pharyngeal or going after the, the, the main external branch. Um, but most people who get radiation don't suffer from first bite very long. Yeah, I, that's interesting. I, um, I have seen first bite, of course, and it, it seems to me it's patients where they've had a very low branching of the branches of the external carotid artery. So it's you're close to the bulb um, or closer to the, to the takeoff of the ECA. But um, yeah, I'm, you know, I just reflexively take everything distal to the takeoff of the superior thyroid. But maybe, maybe I don't need to mess with the ascending pharyngeal. It is small and sometimes you don't even see it. Correct, right. 
And, and I'll right, say just you've clipped it. You've usually clipped it pretty well. So I, I typically ligate and not transect the vessels. And sometimes you can actually see some of the uh, the, the branches of the um, sympathetic uh, nerve supply. And you can actually put your uh, forceps inside of it and, and sneak the, the, the suture underneath it, tie it off and, and not disrupt them. Is that your rationale for not transecting um, the artery? Yeah. Uh, not, no, 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 just why well, have two cut ends when you don't need them? I just one tie and that's it. Okay. Same. Uh, yeah, same here. I mean, that's the first time I've heard that position. I'm not saying that, you know, that's not what most people do, but that's the first time that I've heard that. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't cut the artery either. I, I just yeah, put a couple of clicks on. Yeah. Well, maybe then I'm the exception to the rule that I <laughs> wouldn't be the first one. Um, uh, Nicole, I'm trying to pull up that second polling question. I, I can't. Do you think you can do that possibly? Okay. Um, so if a, a post torus bleeding occurs, um, I'd like to hear what the audience has to say about their preferred management strategy. Um, do you attempt to control the bleeding transorally in the emergency room? or on the floor, attempt to control the bleeding in the OR transorally? Do you attempt to control the bleeding transorally and ligate um, the external carotid, or do you just observe and manage conservatively? So it seems that the ED approach is, uh, is not viable. Um, and that it's, it's interesting that, um, can we, uh, can we have that um, shared with everyone, please, the results? It looks like it's shared. It is? Okay. Because on mine, it says, okay, now it says now viewing. So, so there is a small percentage of people who would attempt to control it in the emergency room. Um, but it seems that the vast majority would do it transorally without going into the neck, um, at least by a two to one margin. Um, so... I find that to be interesting. Um, I think I imagine that's a, that depends on if you've already ligated. That's right. That might be all the people who are already ligating. Right. Yeah. There's no benefit to going in if you already ligated. That's true. That's true. Well, um, I have one more question related to um, to this type of situation. Um, what do the panelists feel about the order of of um, ligation? Do you do the neck first and ligate, or do you the primary first and then go into the neck and ligate? So let, let's start out with Megan on that. Uh, for me, that's, I think, largely a function of training and, and just that uh, we wanted the primary out so that we had the ability to have pathology look at margins, you know, and still be able to progress during the case. Um, I don't find that it, it I have so much bleeding that I need to have ligated beforehand um, in the neck. And so I, I find I can do the operation just fine, not ligating, uh, send the pathology or send the specimen off to pathology, take my margins, and then uh, proceed with the neck dissection while we're waiting. Um, and then if I have to go back, I will set the robot back up and, and do it, you know, uh, do anything else that I have to do. Um, so that's 100% uh, how I was trained, and um, I'd be curious to see what somebody had said who's, who's done it both ways. So, you here? I can comment on that. I, I've <laughs> probably done every iteration. <laughs> so, uh, initially, just because of OR availability and things like that, um, you know, I was not able. Uh, to get these cases on fairly easily. So I did the neck first, a uh, week later, pretty much quite routine would do, follow that with the tour. So the neck, ligate the facial lingual, then uh, do the primary resection. And, and it, that was fine. I worked fine, no problems. I, I had zero uh, 
fistulas or anything, any concerns for uh, spit in the neck. Uh, as things progressed, and particularly with COVID, when everyone started to have to get COVID tested, um, that has shifted. And so I do them, I do it all at once. Um, I start off with the primary and then uh, we'll follow that up with the neck. And depending on if instruments are ready or not, and if they tell me we don't have your tour stuff ready, but the patient in the neck stuff is ready, I'll start with the neck and then um, finish off with the tours. Uh, I think the advantage of doing it, you know, as you mentioned, Megan, the, the, the primary first, I haven't noticed a difference, by the way, Barry. I, I, don't, I don't think there's that big of a difference other than I, I do get um, communications into the neck uh, when I do it all the same day, not every time, but on a tonsil case on occasion. And that has not really presented it to be a problem long-term. Recently, if I have a reasonable um, amount of the external carotid exposed, you know, sometimes kind of in near the hyoid, if on the lateral wall, you may have a little bit of that exposed or you can just kind of see it beating through and there's some fascia over it. Uh, I have uh, on occasion rotated a submandibular gland into that defect. Uh, in those cases, I will uh, add a little caveat that I don't clip the facial um, per se, because then you, you lost your blood supply to the, to the gland itself. So that's, those are kind of the scenarios. I've been through a number of them. Um, happy to answer any questions about them, but I don't feel like ultimately your question is, do I see a difference? I don't really see a big difference. And I think whatever functions for you, uh, I think it's ideal to probably do it all at once and kind of not have to put the patient through multiple bouts of anesthesia. Uh, and, and, and so that's where we are, at least in the current state. David, yeah. So I I'm I'm follow what Megan described in the in the sense that the vast majority of my tours and neck dissections are done concurrently. At this point, I will say, like we hear early on in my experience, way back when tours was first being done, when I battled for OR time and robot time and all that type of stuff. I did every iteration of neck dissection on a different day before, neck dissection on a different day after, all kinds of rationale. And, and I didn't feel like there was a big issue with it. Um, as I got more uh, access to the robot and sort of tours took hold a little bit, both nationally and at my institution, was around the same time that the information on the bleeding and the ligation of vessels came out. At, at which point I stopped altogether doing tours prior to a neck dissection on separate days. Uh, I've already described, I do them almost all concurrently. And now when I do them concurrently, I do what Megan does, which is the primary resection first so that the pathologist can have all the time in the world with the specimen assessing for margins while I'm doing the neck dissection. Uh, I've had some communications. I think it's very rare. I don't think it's really ever a problem. You leave the submandibular gland in place. You could suture it closed. You could flip a piece of digastric back over. I put a drain in and I actually still feed them uh, on post-op day one with clears and stuff and just make sure there's not a leak. That high in the pharynx, there's typically not and patients do fine. Okay, so... Um... I think we'll move on to the second case. Um, that was a really good discussion, thank you. So this is a case of a 58 year old female who had a history of a nasopharyngeal carcinoma um, treated in uh, 2011 with CRT, who presented with a midline basic tongue uh, mass, which turned out to be an adenoid cystic carcinoma. So this kind of shows you um, the location and the, uh, and the size of the mass. Um, this is the specimen once uh, it's been removed. Um, and this is the, um, the residual defect that's present. You see the epiglottis, um, obviously, in the middle of the picture. Um, and this is the post-operative CT scan of this patient. Just wanted you have an idea of the, uh, of the defect size. 
um, that um, that was there. And just the uh, a sagittal view as well. So getting back to what happened to this patient, she was discharged on post-op day three. Um, prior to discharge, she was seen by our speech language people as an inpatient. And she was cleared for a soft diet with thin liquids. And she returned on post-op day seven with an inability to tolerate any PO intake, none whatsoever. Um, so my question, my first question to the panelists is, um, would you have done a TORS resection on a patient like this, given her prior history of radiation therapy? So David, why don't you lead us off? Uh, I wouldn't entirely exclude it, but I would counsel the patient and, and frankly myself that this patient is going to have poorer wound healing, a higher risk of long-term dysphagia and all that goes uh, with it. Uh, so I, I, you know, I referenced before that I typically don't electively put in feeding tubes for TORS, but a patient like this, depending on her baseline swallowing function, which can't be normal 10 years after nasopharyngeal radiation, uh, I would highly consider that. I think this is a, uh, uh, Over here. sorry. Go no, go ahead. I was, this is an extremely challenging case where you have you know, a pathology that is probably more suitable. I mean, they've already had radiation. And then it's just a matter of how you want to remove it. Um, I think I would probably have done the same thing um, that you did. Uh, what a challenge. And then I think once we got to that place where, the, you know, they weren't swallowing, uh, the question is, is would you do a flap and then, you know, have a tracheostomy, a feeding tube, and then see if they can recover anything in the long term? Would you do that up front or delayed? Uh, you know, I don't know. We would always, whenever we have cases like this, which is very rare, uh, we book it as a TORS and a possible flap. Um, and so I, I, most of the time will, you know, we'll put our heads together, uh, me and the recon surgeon, and then decide at the time. Again, very rare. I think we've had one or two cases of this in the past six or seven years. So uh, this is tough, but um, I, I think, what are you going to do with the tumor otherwise? I mean, that's the problem. Uh, yeah, open resection and flap. Well, I've stayed away from the, from the flap issue uh, in principle. Um, because I know it's fairly controversial, so, but I mean, it's certainly a, in this particular instance, a, vi a viable option and was a thought, but we elected not to go that way. Megan, what, what was your thoughts on this? I, I, I'm with everyone else so far in that this particular pathology is not really a the best outcome as a surgical approach. Um, the morbidity of an open procedure is going to leave you with the exact same difficulty in dysphagia. So the TORS approach is um, perfect. It's a very challenging case, so it should not be somebody's first one or two years. You need to think of to uh, salvage TORS as an additional risk for bleeding, like a systematic review that I did. We showed that that's an uh, increased risk for major bleed. You're not going to be doing neck dissections for this because adenoid cystic carcinoma doesn't usually go to the neck, at least I wouldn't have. So that would have been one more reason for me to want to trach the patient just from a bleeding risk um, standpoint. Um, and, and the risk for delayed bleed, the salvage uh, TORS patients can bleed very late up, up to like 22 days and in, in, because they don't heal well. And um, and that just has you not knowing how you're gonna manage it. And so if you if they're traits, you know you can observe them. And if not, you're a little bit wary of it. Um, not to mention the fact that, uh, you know, Surrender DeBoss did a really great study on, on salvage tours and showed that 20%, 30% may be long-term peg dependent. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't peg them up front, um, but I would put in the, the feeding tube that plan to go home with it, see how they do, and, and you can get them that peg um, if they need it. Um, but then you don't have to worry about them being malnourished and, and helping them heal. 
Um, but again, that, I think that's a lot of my extreme conservative conservatism as a junior um, faculty member in, in doing this. I tend to be sort of like overly cautious. And I also, my patients are, they go home and they're far away. So I can't rely on the fact they're gonna go to a local ER and get there and they live far from ERs. Um, so I, I probably would be overly cautious with this, but I don't think that the, the approaches that was taken was uh, uh, you know, inappropriate. I, you have to see how they do with swallowing. Well, yeah, I, I think we're going to get a happy ending here. Let's see, Barry, because, I mean, if you look at this, even what you've presented so far, we all know post-op day seven is is like the nadir. Like that, that's the worst time for the patient, five, six, seven. So this patient's dehydrated and inability to take PO. There's lots of factors there that are not necessarily long-term. And the fact that the patient was doing well on post-day day two and three as per your SLP clearance and assessment, how does she do? Um, well, Nicole, could you put up the, uh, um, the first poll question? Oh, okay, yes. Uh, no, no. Um, I'd like you know I'd like everyone to 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 vote in general um, about this, um, um, and then I'll, I'll tell you how she did, um, because this is the last question that I'd like to ask the panelists um, in the interest of time. And I see we have a lot of questions in the chat, so um, question is. Um, I prophylactically place an NG tube in a torus console base of tongue patient, uh, always, sometimes, rarely, and never. And I would say the uh, everyone sees it, um, vast majority, um, always. Um, we don't see it. You don't see it? It said it. it said now it we do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So the 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 answer to the question is the patient did well. Um, and yeah. she's taking an oral diet and she doesn't have any pain anymore. Um, and the margins were negative on top of everything. So um, um, th this is a happy ending story, uh, fortunately. Um, my question is, um, what are the panelists position on a, um, a uh, peg uh, in these particular patients? Um, does the fact that they've had prior CRT or radiation impact the decision-making process to put a peg in or not put a peg in. Um, what are your thoughts? Me here, why don't we kick it off with you? Sure. So I, I think of this group, I'm, I'm probably the most conservative when it comes to swallow uh, and feeding. So I, I typically put in a, a feeding or NG tube in, in every patient. And then so I'm, I, I don't mind it being there for a while, uh, up to, you know, at, when I first started, it would keep it in for three weeks. So for this patient, I would, I would let them, you know, have, uh, a feeding in tube for a feeding and a nasogastric tube or a dop off tube in for a fairly reasonable amount of time. I mean, three weeks to a month before I committed them to having a peg tube. I mean, Obviously, they're probably going to be seeing, so they see, they'll see speech weekly and be assessed and reassessed. And if speech were to say, listen, they're, they're really, it aren't in, they are not improving. This continues to be a problem. We should, we maybe we should consider a, a you know, feeding tube in, in the stomach sooner uh, rather than later. Uh, however, I, I have not um, put in a feeding tube prior to three weeks. I don't think in any, any patient. So far, and making your thoughts. So, if I were in an ideal world, I would be exactly like my here. It would be NG two for three weeks, do that intense swallow therapy every week. Um, but what I run into in my practice area is that not all the patients have access to the intense swallow therapy with the type of insurance that they have. Um, with the salvage patients, if it, if they live far away, and I doubt that I'm going to get them back every week for that assessment and, and for intense therapy, then I just put in a peg and I get them as much therapy as they can and, and plan to get it out by three months. It doesn't mean I'm not gonna try, uh, but I, I worry about their progress for the salvage, the salvage patients. 
um, just because I know they're starting from such a, a bad baseline or if they have any sort of, you know, pre-op dysphagia. And that's a whole patient selection thing. You know, ideally you're not, the people who have pre-op dysphagia, it's only going to get worse post-op. Um, so if they're a pre-op dysphagia at all, um, I'm, I'm thinking peg. But in the salvage setting, uh, I've rarely seen them do well. I'm a bit of a pessimist. Uh, and we struggle with our, our swallow protocol. Well, just to tell you, e even though I practice in an urban area and you practice in a less urban area, let's put it that way, um, the majority of, of our patients are, are treatment failures. And so we're very quick to put pegs in people um, because we know that they're going to be um, debilitated from a swallowing perspective for a significant period of time. So that's just kind of our philosophy. David? Yeah, so, so I'm glad you clarified that, Barry, because I do think that salvage surgery is a very different beast than primary surgery in non-radiated patients. So it's interesting. I'm glad you asked this question because Mira here and I and Megan were talking a little bit about this before we got on the on the video here. And the way my practice has migrated is very early on, back when Tours was first starting, we were all taught to be conservative. I, uh, you know, the mandated protocol in my practice was everybody gets an SLP evaluation on post-op day one in the hospital and everybody has a dab off tube. And after a few years of doing that and watching patients have their dab off tube removed on post-op day one and two and recognizing that my ability to predict which ones would have it removed and which ones wouldn't and that I was putting in dab off tubes that are a foreign body and just sitting there almost unused the first night and bothering people, why not go the opposite approach? So almost on the turn of a coin, we switched our protocol to no dab off tubes in anybody. And we do the same post-op day one assessment with speech path and then decide who needs them from that point forward. And we've been very pleased with this. I mean, it, it's probably about 15% of patients get dab off tubes placed, which means the 85% of patients just never need it. And sure, they struggle, they lose a little weight, they have pain, they have all that type of stuff as you would expect post-op day four or five. But part of it is prepping them for it, like education. And part of it is prepping them for it with, with medications. And overall, you know, they're all obviously swallowing before three weeks. The ones who have the dab off tube placed, then we have the protocol, they come back, they get an office assessment and they're usually out in two to three weeks uh, anyway. But the salvage radiated patients, totally different story. I would have a low threshold to peg those patients or you know, certainly put a dab off tube in or expect it. Great. Um, it's interesting. I, I would say my patients are, they would much rather have their NG tube in. I mean, I have this discussion with them. They would much rather have their NG tube in when they're asleep. Um, and then you say, well, we may have to put one in on the second day. Um, and I'm just kind of a little unwilling to like put them through that. Um, but I, I think it's also just part of the wanting your patients to be happy with you as a junior faculty, you know, and, uh, and like, uh, Dave, with all of his experience, like him just knowing which ones he's going to need it. I'm not there yet. So <laughs> No, to be clear, Megan, our protocol is very much based on me not knowing which ones are going to need it. If I did, I would selectively place them. I went from all to none because I don't feel, you'd be surprised. That's why I said to Barry, I bet you this woman's doing fine with, with that big defect. You'd be surprised how the ones that you think are terrible do well. And some of the ones that should be chip shots, uh, they, they just don't. And you can't tell. So, um, yeah, I agree with you. All right, Neil, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Great. Well, I, I, that was a fantastic discussion. Um, all of your answers were, were wrong. So <laughs> I, um, I've been populating the chat, the chat board with all the right answers. No, I'm kidding. That was, you know, I think it's, it's so complex and it's so interesting how things evolve. Um, and David, I really appreciate your comments about not being able to predict 
And uh, that's been my experience as well. And I, I do routinely put in a Dobhoff feeding tube, but then I let our, our speech team kind of call the shot on when it can come out. And um, uh, I guess the reason I put it in is just to uh, keep them hydrated and give them a jump start on their nutrition, expecting that so many patients are going to lose weight and need adjuvant therapy. Uh, so um, I think many of the questions were covered so far. Um, I guess one last question for the panelists, and then we should probably call it. There was a question about transition to the SP from the SI and how that's, how that's changed all of this. And I guess um, maybe, maybe you can just raise your hand if you're using an SP now. Um, looks like Megan, Barry, Mahir, David, you're not. No, I guess my institution is a bunch of laggards. Okay, um, well, then you're out, of, out of the discussion, but maybe Megan and Mahir, Barry, you can just comment a little bit on the, on the transition and how <coughs> some of these topics. Um, we'll start, Megan, or, or Barry? I find it not to be terribly different than um, uh, than the uh, SI. I, I do think that, um, to be very frank, um, our residents who, who participate in the surgery are more facile with the um, SP than they are with the SI. And, and I don't have any really good explanation for that. Um, maybe it's because we have a lab and they're able to practice uh, on simulation um, whereas with the SI, they didn't have that, that problem or that, that option. Um, the setup is clearly easier and quicker. Um, and and I, you know, I'm very pleased with the results. So, um, so I, in a way, I'm very, very happy that we switched over to the SP, but we're very fortunate. Um, unlike Jefferson per se, um, we have the largest um, volume of robotic surgery in the country from our general surgeons and our urologists. So um, Intuitive has been very, very um, supportive. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of robots here. Um, so it's relatively um, easy to get onto the SP. I, I can add a few things. Um, so I, I think the SP has, uh, been a, a really nice transition for just from the viewing standpoint where you can get the camera to view things. I struggle in fear on, for particularly for tonsils on the inferior aspect of the tonsil and getting that margin along the lateral pharyngeal wall can be a challenge. So sometimes you have to take the tongue base to help with that. What, what I've started to do now is actually I go to that area first and use, I actually incorporate the third arm to retract and, and it helps no matter what level assistant I have, uh, it, it, I'm able to kind of navigate, I think the operation a little bit better. So I'll make that cut first and just kind of get sneak underneath the, um, uh, looking up from the posterior pharyngeal wall, just to see that area and make that cut, release it. And, and then, you know, proceed to the you know, different parts of the operation. But I think that has really helped uh, for me um, and having SP has been nice in that, that uh, from that standpoint. You can also use it in so many different ways where in, in terms of having that other arm, it does not really impact what level you know, help I have. Um, I also like the scissors, you know, it has scissors on there that are really nice for, I, I like using that sometimes for the tonsil. Uh, I think having that option um, is really nice because it cuts cold and it has cautery. So I think sometimes you can play your margins a little bit different um, without having to worry about uh, cautery effect. So it makes it a little bit easier also for the pathologist to read the, the, the margins if it's, you know, if you use specimen driven margins. So I, I really do like that, the, the transition. I we haven't had yeah. ours. Um for very long. Uh, we've had it since January. So in one sense, I think it's a step forward with the third arm and uh, instruments as uh, Mahir was saying that if you do like a superglottic laryngectomy, having the scissors to make the cord cut or the arytenoid cut, 
stops that margin cauterization uh, phenomenon, but the, um, and certainly the assistants, like my, my residents, they actually can assist and they're better at uh, positioning because of the, the way it maintains. You know, you're not having to pull arms out and reposition the depth and all of that. It's, it's easier to reload. The staff likes it better for that reason. So they're, they're more confident when it comes to doing like an instrument change if I'd like one. Um, but I would say that the learning curve it's a step back for me for the learning curve because I was so, I'm so used to the, the SI and the working distance from, for the SI. Um, it's a different working distance because of the, the Cobra position and bringing the way the arms have to come out to, to keep the tennis ball working distance. So you're a little bit farther back um, with the camera than you would otherwise be with the SI and I tend to find myself getting in closer with the camera and then having to go wait a minute I'm I'm bumping myself I'm limiting myself with the camera I need I can use the zoom so I can back this camera out and now I can use the zoom and now I'm not impeding my own working distance so that those like skip collisions with the the camera is is something I'm still in the learning curve uh for and and maternity leave has not helped with that phenomenon so um uh, I'm looking forward to getting back and like ascending that part of that learning curve. Well, congratulations, Megan, uh, on the new addition to the family. Thanks. And thank you to all the panelists, Barry, for uh, co-moderating this. For the audience, thank you for uh, participating. Don't forget there is a survey that is sent out by the Head Neck Society. This is useful for our um, sponsors in supporting endeavors like this. And also don't forget, we have three more webinars coming up that are gonna hit uh, the whole, the full gamut of topics. So I think it's uh, really been a lot of fun and I look forward to uh, more discussions in the weeks to come. Take care y'all. And I thank you all um, from my perspective. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. We really had a great time. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. Thank you.